is fabulous. Amen. I'm in the way, right? Okay. Oh, God. I'm exhausted already. I haven't even got started yet. As the choir comes down, will you pray with me? God, we thank you. We thank you that the feast of the Lord is going on right here and that you have spread this table so that we may come and taste and see just how good God is. So God, open us up to all that you would have for us this day. And we thank you for what you're doing in us and through us. Guide us, God, direct us, lead us, and remind us that you are always welcoming us to the table. Amen. Amen. So during, this is interesting. Different perspective. I like it. Okay, I'm getting used to it. Okay, during February, we're delving into this series entitled Come to the Table. This month, we hear the call to dine with Jesus, an invitation that means more than a simple eating experience. It never was like that for Jesus. The table was a place where he not only fed people, but he challenged them with acts of um, hospitality to reflect the ways of God. So when we say yes to a place at God's table, we accept a way of life that embraces God's definition of love, peace, grace, and joy. We begin this Sunday at the Last Supper table. The following weeks in February, we will consider the kitchen table, the peace summit table, and the potluck table. We begin our focus around the table in the upper room where Jesus gathered with his disciples one final time before his impending death. Jesus' lessons at the Last Supper are clear. The meal of the kingdom of God is for all, saint, stranger, those who persecute and betray you, those who stand by and watch the abuse but say and do nothing, those who are joyful as well as those who weep. In our scripture lesson for today, the author of the epistle of Romans reminds us and invites us to do as Jesus would do. Do not be overcome with evil, he said, but overcome evil with good. In the words of Jesus, Jesus would have said, take up your cross and follow me and lead, uh, do, uh, follow my example. This requires that we follow God's way in offering a good meal at God's table for all of God's guests. God, uh, John begins the 13th chapter of his gospel this way. He said, before the Passover festival began, Jesus was keenly aware that his hour uh, uh, had come to depart from this world and return to the Father. From the beginning to the end, Jesus' days were marked by his love for his people. Before Jesus and his disciples gathered for dinner, the adversary filled Judas Iscariot's heart with plans of deceit and betrayal. Jesus, knowing that he had come from God and was going away to God, stood up from the dinner table, removed his outer garments, and then he wrapped himself in a towel. He poured water in a basin and began to wash the feet of his disciples, drying them with the towel that had been around his waist. And Simon Peter said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? In other words, have you seen? They haven't seen a bath in a few days, and we've been walking on these dusty, dirty roads, and I haven't had a pedicure in, well, never. Um, and so uh, you, you're not going to want to get down there, right? That's, a, that's not good. And, and while Peter is explaining why, you know, you just really can't do all this, Jesus said, Peter, you don't realize what I'm doing, but you will understand later. And he says, you're not going to wash my feet, not now or ever. And Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have nothing to do with me. And then Peter said, then wash me and don't stop with my feet. Cleanse my head and my head as well. And in other words, clean me from head to toe, right? And then Jesus said, anyone, listen, anyone who has bathed is clean except for their feet. Because obviously they walked on dirt. But I tell you this, not all of you are clean. The commentator here says, within pain and filth, there is an opportunity to extend God's kingdom through an expression of love, humility, and service. The simple act of washing feet is a metaphor for how the world looks through the lens of Jesus' grace. He sees the people, the world he created, which he also loves. He also sees the filthy corruption in the world that torments everyone. Jesus' mission is to cleanse those whom he loves from those horrors. This is his redemptive work with feet, family, disease, famine, and hearts. 
When Jesus sees disease, he sees an opportunity to heal. When he sees sin, he sees a chance to forgive and redeem. When he sees dirty feet, he sees a chance to wash them. Jesus knew the one with plans of betraying him, which is why Jesus said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet of the disciples, he picked up his garments and he reclined at the table again. And I believe that is when, though John doesn't mention it here, I believe that's when Jesus took the cup. And after having given God thanks for it, he passed among them and said, this is my life force, which is poured out for you. Take and drink all of it. This is my, the bread, which is my body, which is broken open for all of you. Take and eat. And you will do this every time you gather around a table, which we gather around tables all the time. And every time you gather, right, remember me. And Jesus continued. And he sat back down with them and he said, do you understand what I have done? To you, you call me teacher and Lord, and truly that's who I am. So if your teacher and Lord wash your feet, then you ought to wash one another's feet. I am your example. Keep doing what I'm doing. I tell you the truth, a servant is not greater than the master. Those who are sent are not greater than the one who sends them. If you know these things and if you put them into practice, you will find happiness. I'm not speaking about all of you. I know whom I have chosen but let the Hebrew scripture be fulfilled that says the very same man who eats my bread with me will stab me in the back. Assuredly, I tell you these truths before they happen so that when it all transpires, you will believe that I am. I tell you the truth. Anyone who accepts the one who accepts me accepts the one who sends me. And in turn, the one who accepts me also accepts the one who sent me. And then Jesus, John records, became visually distressed. I tell you the truth, he said, one of you will betray me. The disciples began to stare at one another, wondering who was the unfaithful disciple. One disciple in particular, the one whom Jesus loved, reclining next to him at the table. Peter motioned to that disciple at Jesus' side and said, find out who the betrayer is. And the beloved disciple asked Jesus, Lord, who is it? And Jesus responded, I will dip a piece of bread in my cup and give it to the one who will betray me. And then Jesus dipped one piece in the cup and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. After this occurred, John records, Satan entered into Judas. And then Jesus said to Judas, make haste and do what you're going to do. No one understood Jesus' instructions to Judas, John records. But because Judas carried the money, some of them thought that he was being instructed to buy the necessary items for the feast or give money to the poor. So Judas took his piece of bread and departed into the night. Upon Judas' departure, Jesus spoke. Now the Son of Man will be glorified as God is glorified in him. If God's glory is in him, his glory is also in God. The moment of this astounding glory is imminent. My children, my time here is brief. You will be searching for me. And as I told the Jews, you cannot go where I'm going. So I give you a new command. Love each other deeply. And fully remember the ways that I've loved you and demonstrate your love for others in those same ways everyone you know everyone will know you are my followers if you demonstrate your love to others and then it was when Peter said he wanted to go where Jesus was going and and Jesus said you can't go now but you'll go later and Peter said no I'll follow you anywhere and Jesus reminded him before the cock crows three times you will have denied me those three times. But saints, I believe through this narrative that we learn three things from this table that is set before us, that we learn what Jesus can do with us as we follow Jesus' example. Here are these lessons that I would submit for our consideration this morning that we model these things that he taught us here. And it also goes along with the scripture that was read this morning where Paul admonishes us not to be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. And we can do this, and we learn these things at the table. Like Jesus, we welcome everyone. Two, like Jesus, we serve everyone. And like Jesus, we love everyone. Knowing what Jesus knew, Jesus still welcomed everybody to the table. The betrayer, the denier, the timid, those turncoats, the ones taking the easy non-confrontational role, the I don't want any trouble so I'll just hide back in my closet until all this mess is over types. Jesus washed every foot 
around that table. He didn't skip a one, not the dirty ones or the clean ones, the male, the female, and the gender non-conforming ones, the do-gooders and the hell-raisers, the religious elite and the illiterate, the local and the foreigner, the native and the undocumented, the member and the non-member. It mattered not their status, their orientation, their identification, or their legitimacy. Jesus welcomed them all to the table. Jesus included all of them in his blessing. Jesus gave a piece of bread and dipped the cup to all of them. Jesus took the foot of the one who would end up hurting him. Jesus would continue to welcome any and everybody who would come and I am so grateful, I am thankful to serve a church, to serve a movement, a denomination where there are no rules that govern the table of God. I was thinking this morning, a, a co-worker of mine once, her mother passed away and they were Catholic. And, and so we all, all, all of us, the, the, the um, funeral was in the afternoon and so we all left the corporate office and, and we went over to the to the Catholic Church for the funeral, and they served communion. And this was my first Catholic funeral, so um, do y'all serve it every time you do a funeral? Do you have communion every time you do a funeral? No? No? Okay, whatever. Okay. They served communion. Anyway. And so, and I was sitting kind of um, on the second row. A bunch of us were together. And then they said, if you're not Catholic, you're supposed to come to the table like this. No, I'm not coming to the table like this because I'm coming open to God's table, right? And it was so hard, right? It was so hard because before that, it would not have been strange to me. Growing up in the church, you had to be a member at my church to, to come and receive communion there. But, but, but now, having experienced an open table, how dare someone refuse us the table of God? Jesus didn't refuse anybody the table so that we've gotten that wrong when we decide that somebody can't come because of what they've done or who they love or where they sleep or what they don't do, right? But I'm grateful that our table is open and it's accessible to each and every person. This is the first lesson we learn from this table that Jesus set that everyone is welcomed to it. Secondly, I would offer up that from this lesson we learn that we, from Jesus, that we serve everyone from the strength and the sustenance that we get from the gifts at the table. And how do we do that? We follow his example. Jesus didn't leave anybody out when he passed the cup around. He didn't say, oh, no, I don't like you anymore because of what you said, so let me just skip you, or I'm going to pass over you because I don't like the, what you, how you just looked at me, and I'm going to go over this way, right? Jesus continued to pass the cup around to everybody because he modeled what we should do. It's much like Mother Teresa modeled in serving. From 1931 to 1948, Mother Teresa taught at St. Mary's High School in Calcutta, India. But the suffering and the poverty that she glimpsed outside the convent walls made such a deep impression on her that in 1948, she received permission from her superiors to leave the convent school and devote herself to working among the poorest of the poor in the slums of Calcutta. Her primary task was to love and care for the neglected, the dying, the poor, the orphaned, the lepers, the AIDS victims, and the many others that nobody else was prepared or willing to look after. The majority of her efforts were to allow these folks to die with dignity. They were already in the process of dying, and, and so she allowed them to die with dignity, and she cared for them in her final days, and she earned her title saint of the gutter by working with those who had been found in the gutters of her society. She modeled serving others just like Jesus did by washing the disciples' feet doing the thing that nobody else was willing or prepared to do. And much like what I'll go ahead and name a modern-day saint, Candace Payne, she put 80 homeless people in hotel rooms during this past week during the deep freeze in Chicago. Do you know most of the deaths that occurred in the deep freeze were homeless people? They froze to death on the streets. And this woman... Willing and able opened up an opportunity to save 80 lives by offering them hotel rooms for a few days. Saints, it doesn't take much, right? It just simply takes a willingness 
to serve any and everybody. And lastly, I would submit that we're able to do those things, to welcome and to serve people because we're first instructed to love everybody just like Jesus did, right? Luke tells us about the lawyer who, who tried to trip Jesus up by asking him what he had to do, remember, to gain eternal life. And Jesus turned the tables and asked the fellow, the learned fellow of the law, what the law actually says. And without hesitation, this gentleman routed off the requirement stated succinctly in the law, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor, he said, as yourself. Jesus affirmed that the lawyer had answered correctly, not able to leave well enough alone and having to have the last word perhaps, and certainly to justify himself as Luke records, the lawyer asked for clarification. That's what you do, right, George? That's, that's, you just, I told George later, I, I, I told him earlier, I'm going to call you out in the sermon, and he said, yeah, you do it three times just to make sure that they're going to give you the same answer. So he kept asking Jesus uh, what, uh, you know, what this was, and so he said, um, so I need clarification, sir. Who is my neighbor? And Jesus told him, remember the story of the Good Samaritan. Our neighbor is anyone in need whom I might be able to help. In the book we're studying um, in Spiritual Transformation this month, Everybody Always, Becoming Love in a World Full of Setbacks and Difficult People, which I highly recommend, by the way. In that book, Bob Goff, the author says, Jesus saw loving God and loving our neighbor as one inseparable mandate. Jesus knew that we couldn't love God if we don't love the people God surrounds us with. There's no school to learn how to love your neighbor just the house next door. No one expects us to love them flawlessly, but we can love them fearlessly, furiously, and unreasonably. And we aren't supposed to just love those next door, but Jesus thought we should start with them. I bet he said, Jesus knew that if, we, that if our love isn't going to work for the people who live close to us, then it's probably not going to work for the rest of the world. Jesus never defined who our neighbors were, so we just go and love everybody, he said, always. Bob Goff loved his next-door neighbor who moved in. She was a widow, and, and she developed cancer, and, and she was all alone. And, and the biggest thing was her fear at night when nobody was there if something were to happen to her. And so he said he went and bought some walkie-talkies, and he gave her one, and he kept one by his bed. And he said, you just push this button, and you let me know, and I'll come running. And he said several times his neighbor, Carol, pushed the button during the middle of the night, and he went to care for her. He helped her, she was no longer feeling alone. That was the neighborly thing to do. Jesus loved those he met that weren't always so nice, those who harassed him, those who would abandon him, and he just kept on loving them, and he didn't worry about whether they deserved it or not. Jesus told the disciples that letting people see the way we love each other would be the best way to let people know about God. They will know that you are my disciples by the way you love one another. As the Apostle Paul wrote, love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers, bless those who persecute you, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. I've got that down pat. Live in harmony with each other. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, Give them something to drink. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. These are the things that we can learn from the table. This table teaches us how to welcome, serve, and love everybody always. May that love be evident in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen.